Hi there, it's Ray and today I'm going to talk about all the wonderful books which I read in January. This was my first month trialling using a new TBR creation system that I've kind of made up for myself, whereby I draw postcards to prompt me to read specific kind of genres, just like areas and ideas for books that I want to read, not specific titles. And so I drew 12 of those actually mid-January, I was a little bit slow getting around to doing my first one. And I'm so happy to say that I've read 11 books this month, which I think might be my record. This is classic booktube effect, like 11 books in a month is insane to me, would have been insane to me for most of my life, um, but I just... I just am enjoying reading more and more and managing to make more and more time for it in my days, to spend more time listening to audiobooks while I'm doing other things, bits and pieces like that which have gradually upped the amount which I'm reading. I also just was in a really good place with reading in January, I really enjoyed what I was reading, so it's very easy to make time for it. So without further ado, let me talk you through what I read and what I thought of it. So the first book is one that I read, I can't believe this was this year, it feels an age ago. It's called A Manual for Heartbreak by Kathy Ransombrink, and this is one that my fiancé, Tom's mum, recommended to me while I was staying with them over New Year. Um, so I read it in her copy while I was at the house there, she said she'd recently read it and absolutely adored it and wanted to recommend it to me to read too. It's quite a short book, it's sort of part memoir, part self-help, I guess. It's quite hard to pin your finger on exactly what genre this is. It's the story of Kathy's own experiences with grief, although she has written another book which I believe deals very much with the more kind of memoir side of the story. And this book was more about her process of dealing with grief and with sorrow and with sadness in life and her advice to her younger self as to what she would have advised her younger self to do in order to cope with the severe depression that she's suffered over the last 20 years or so. Um, and it's her advice also for everybody else who's going through. Really, she's quite clear anything difficult or sad, it doesn't have to be something massive like the death of a really close special loved one. I really like the fact that this book has been written, you know, I think it's important to talk about the dark, hard times in our life and it was nice to read about somebody who just addresses that head on and, you know, points out that life isn't fair, points out that our society in general as a culture avoids discussing grief, is awkward around it, the etiquette around how to talk to somebody who's grieving is not really explicitly there and she has a couple of pages on kind of like do's and don'ts for things to say to somebody who's grieving which I thought was quite helpful um, and yeah overall she just has lots of advice. I thought it was good, I thought it was a nice read, I felt like all the advice was quite common sense which I guess if you're in one of those situations where you're feeling really upset and grieving, it can be really helpful and reassuring just to read some common sense advice, but I also didn't feel like it necessarily gave me any new ideas or new takes or new perspectives that I hadn't already got. I feel like depending on where you're at in your life, this is a sort of book that could be really, really special and meaningful and helpful for you. I just happened to read it at a time when I guess fortunately I didn't really need it and so I found it a good read but I don't think it's one that will really stay with me. Next thing that I read is Under the Stars by Matt Gore. This is a non-fiction book which explores the night sky and the role of the night sky throughout history and particularly the place that the night sky has in our modern world where we kind of live in this permanent electric glow of street lamps and LEDs and things which make our world continuously bright and get said in this book that like in London it's constantly the light level of a cloudy day which is just like insane um, even in the middle of the night. This was something that I was really really looking forward to so I mean look how beautiful the cover is. I love the night sky, I find it incredibly magical, powerful, the times in my life where I have seen the night sky properly, they're few and far between, but when I've been out somewhere really remote and properly looked up and seen the stars as they're supposed to be, it's completely blown me away. Um, so I was really looking forward to reading this. I love nature writing and I did enjoy this and I did think it was really well written and there were a lot of interesting facts in here, some stuff about like the night sky and folklore which I enjoyed, general historical facts, so, like one that I found interesting for example was about the origin of the word curfew coming from couvre-feu 
which is French for cover the fire. Uh, this is particularly interesting to me at the moment because there is a curfew in the city that I'm living in and uh, the language that we speak here is French so we call it couvre-feu and it came from there being a set time in cities where everybody had to put out their lamps, put out their candles as a way of trying to stop there being fires caused during the night. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I picked up a lot of nice little things from here but it kind of made me realise that I definitely prefer my nature writing within the context of something fictional rather than non-fiction because, I don't know, it just felt a bit contrived, which obviously it, it is. Like, obviously the purpose is that he writes individual chapters about light and dark and different places. So yeah, overall I enjoyed it. I just wasn't as swept away as I thought I was going to be, given that this kind of had all of the components of something I should have really, really adored. The writing was beautiful, the subject matter was stuff I was really interested in. I think I just missed it being a story and me therefore feeling really connected to it. Then I listened to Write Ho Jeeves by P.G. Woodhouse. I am ongoing listening to these, at the, currently at the rate of about one a month. Um, and they are, they are starting to blend into one. They've kind of all blended into one ever since the very beginning. But what was a little bit different about this to the ones which I have heard so far, I've been listening to them all on audiobook, is that this was actually written as a novel. So it had one continuous plot line the whole way through. Whereas all the other ones I read, each chapter was basically a mini standalone story. And I think, like, I think probably overall the novel is funnier, but just because I tend to listen to them really sporadically, I felt like I didn't follow this as easily as I follow when I read the mini stories. Um, therefore, yeah, it just, the, the structure of it didn't work quite as well for me as the short story structure does. However, it was absolutely hilarious. I mean, it's P.G. Woodhouse. I. I'm increasingly adoring him, increasingly finding his writing just such a place of comfort and joy and hilarity. This book features the French chef Anatole, who is this amazing chef that keeps threatening to leave and the people who employ him are just constantly going to all of these extreme lengths in order to try and keep him in their kitchen because his cooking is just so amazing and it, it really makes me laugh like everything. I mean everything throughout the novel is hilarious but the chef Anatole I find a particularly hilarious character so yeah another very enjoyable P.G. Woodhouse. Then we had Fields of Home by Marie T. Conlon McKenna. I haven't been mentioning, sorry, which prompt linked me to which book, which is because I read the first five books on this list before I even did my TBR cards, and then three of them I managed to match up to what I pulled, but two of them I didn't. And the two of them which I didn't manage to match up to anything were Under the Stars and A Manual for Heartache. Right Ho Jeeves I linked to A Comfort Read, and Fields of Home a link to a historical fiction. So this is a children's historical fiction book and it is the third in the Children of the Famine trilogy by Marita Conlon McKenna which is about three children who initially have to walk across Ireland during the Great Potato Famine and it then follows their lives up through their teenage years into their early adulthood which I really like and one of my favourite things that happened in this third book is that the children have grown up to young adults. The eldest couple are maybe in their early 20s, the youngest one is maybe about 18 or so, and it still follows them. It does not follow their children, even though we have reached a point where like, some of them have started having families. And one of my pet book bears in children's books that follow the children up is when the author, as soon as one of them has had a child, then just focuses on the life of the child and it's like the mother, it's always the mother, the mother basically ceases to exist because she's had a child and it's like her role in being interesting to us is over. Uh, there is a certain Ellen Montgomery series in which that happens and uh, if you know, you know, it annoys me in that and I'm really happy that it didn't happen here. So we follow these three no longer children and there are now all in quite different walks of life, which is just fascinating. Uh, we just see so much history through these. I really feel like these books are just a textbook example of how to write historical fiction for children. So in the second book, the whole story was about the youngest girl emigrating to America. So we continue to see what life is like for a young Irish girl who's emigrated to America, the hardships and loneliness that that encompasses. 
we see with the elder two, one of them is a kind of tenant farmer, so it looks at the unfairness of life for tenant farmers in Ireland, the sort of hiking of rent and how completely out of control normal people were, how they were at risk of losing their livelihoods through absolutely no fault of their own. And it also looks at employment in large country houses. So really fascinating topics, stories just like so nicely told, they're gorgeously written, love all the characters, find it really gripping, really nicely pitched for children, and also honestly just a wonderful read as adults. I would highly recommend this trilogy. I gave the last one five stars. Um, I don't know whether the novel as a standalone would have been a five star, but combined with the two that came before it, I just think this trilogy is absolutely, absolutely fantastic. It's one of those ones I really wish I had read when I was younger because I know I would have adored it, but I'm still really happy to have come to it as an adult and I do intend to read more of Conlon McKenna's work because I've just been so impressed with this trilogy. Next up, I had English Pastoral by James Rebanks, and this was for a UK window, which is a book which shows me a perspective on UK life that is different to my own experience of it. So this was looking at the life of a farmer living in the UK. It's a memoir that covers three generations of men living and working the same farm in the Lake District. And this was absolutely, absolutely brilliant. I love Rebanks' writing. He is just so passionate about his subject. He knows so much about farming because he's a farmer, obviously, but he also has a real gift for writing about it in a way which um, conveys so much beauty and love, but also hard truths. I come away from his books feeling changed, honestly. Um, the main purpose of English Pastoral was to examine the modern agricultural revolution, so the very recent, from I think sort of the 80s onwards, drive for absolutely epic mass production in farming for use of artificial fertilizer, for getting rid of hedgerows and making larger fields, this sort of thing, to look at how that came about, to look at the pressures on farmers, like the cultural pressures, the economic pressures that led them to change their ways, even though this eventually became a style of farming which was incredibly destructive to the landscape, um, and to look at what is happening now as we're kind of coming out of that completely new experiment in what farming is and how we farm and how we engage with the landscape and looking at how farmers are trying to be more kind of eco-friendly in their approach but without avoiding the fact that they are still realistically expected to provide food for the whole population and they don't get paid a lot in order to do that. So yeah, just a brilliant book, so beautiful, so moving could not recommend highly enough. Either this or The Shepherd's Life, which is his first book. I think both of them are absolutely brilliant. Next up, we had A Girl with a Pearl Earring by Tracy Chevalier. This was a historical fiction. I think I put it down as, yep. This is a historical fiction that I was not wild about. I listened to this on audiobook. It's the story of the relationship between, well, it's like the fictional story of the relationship between Vermeer and the girl he painted for the painting, Girl with the Pearl Earring. Um, I just wasn't wild about the way it was written. I didn't really get that attached to the characters and it was fine, but I didn't love it. I don't have that much to say about it. Then as another children's slash YA prompt I had by Ash, Oak and Thorn by Melissa Harrison. This was a really sweet book which I also listened to on audio book um, from Audible. If you subscribe to Audible it's one of the ones you can get in the Audible library which is how I'm listening to most of my audiobooks these days. Um, this was the story of three little hidden folk who are these kind of guardians of the natural world. Their ash tree in which they have lived for many many years gets blown down in a particularly big storm and they set off on a quest to try and find others of their kind because they are beginning to fade to literally become invisible. It's a story for children, I would say, maybe for children from like around seven years old kind of thing. Um, depending on reading level might be one that you would do as a read aloud or one that your child could even read by themselves. I felt Harrison did a really good job at looking at climate change in a really child-friendly, sensitive way 
um, helping children feel like they are responsible for the world, helping them to take an interest in it through these wonderful little hidden folk characters, but not making them feel scared or overly responsible for dealing with and tackling climate change, which I know is an issue that's facing a lot of young people today. A lot of children have a huge amount of climate anxiety and feel responsible for things which are, you know, which they are too young to take responsibility for. So yeah, it was a really lovely story, really sweetly written. The audiobook was really nice because it also had bird song and various other sounds in the background, the wind and different voices for the different characters. I initially wasn't wild about the narrator, but she grew on me as the story went on and overall it was a really lovely listen I would recommend. I think I would particularly recommend it if you have children. I enjoyed it as a read by myself as an adult. If you want a middle grady thing, it didn't read like a classic, but it was a nice book nonetheless. For a comfort read, I read Winnie the Pooh or listened to it on audiobook again. This is one which I've just had recommended to me a lot lately as a reread. Obviously I read it as a child, but it has been a long, 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 long time. Uh, I was surprised by how completely and utterly I remembered absolutely everything that happened in it, but how it also felt really drastically shorter than I remember it feeling when I was younger. Um, these are really sweet, whimsical tales and I enjoyed them. I wasn't as obsessed with them as I thought I was going to be. I thought it was going to set me off on a bit of a Winnie the Pooh craze phase and I was immediately going to want to rush into the house at Pooh Corner. I didn't, but I think this is a book I will really love sharing with children in the future and it was also quite a nice nostalgic ride to just be in the Winnie the Pooh world again. It's a very innocent and comforting place to be. Then I read The Rainbow by D.H. Lawrence as a classic. Oh, I actually even have this one to show you. I'm finally off all my audiobooks and books that I read while I was back in the UK and onto ones that I have physical copies of. I completely and utterly adored this. I'm going to link the reading week of vlog in which I read this because I talked about it a ton in that vlog and I don't want to go over the top again. I feel like I could go on about this book forever. There's just so much to say, so many different things that I loved about it. It's a family saga of three generations of the Brangwen family growing up in Nottinghamshire beginning in the 1840s and ending in the early 1900s. Um, Lawrence is just an incredibly deep and perceptive writer. He it's heavy on the symbolism, his language is deeply descriptive. I have had chats with people on Bookstagram and with my friends in real life who really don't like his writing. I think he's a bit of a love him or hate him type author. I really, really love him. I just find his writing so thought provoking, so beautiful, and I feel like it speaks to my soul. I feel like he does an incredible job of representing the societal, political, sort of sweeping changes which are happening in his writing but also of doing this really kind of micro level detailed view of what it's like on the inside of a person to be alive. When I read his work it really elucidates my own experience of how I feel to exist as a human being and how I have felt at various stages of my life. I feel like he captures those key moments in our life of love, of pain, of loss, of growth and he does that in an incredibly beautiful way which I just adore. So this was such a strong five star read. It has been quite a while since I read anything by him and it was lovely to come back to him to just be reminded that he is absolutely one of my favourite authors of all time and I cannot wait to read his books again and again and again throughout my life. Penultimate book that I read was Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. Is that focusing? Oh, I haven't inked this one in yet. That's why it's hard to see. These last two I finished um, just yesterday. Today is 1st of February. So I have not quite finished off the process of filling them in in pen because I finished them. So Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. Here we are. This is such a classic second-hand copy of a dystopian book kind of cover. Um, this I read as a gap filler, which is books which I feel like I ought to have read but haven't got around to reading yet. Um, quite a nice prompt in terms of being handy and catching me up on things that I want to have read, 
also maybe a little bit of an annoying prompt in that there's a reason that these books are books I feel I ought to have read but have not yet read and that is mostly that I'm not massively keen about the idea of them. Um, Brave New World, I was not massively keen about this book. Um, it's, I think I gave it 2.5 stars in the end and that was a last minute rescue from the two stars that it was going to be until the penultimate or so chapter. I actually featured a fairly interesting conversation about the philosophy around how we should live our lives and basically whether the world is better if everybody is happy all the time and happiness is our chief goal and nobody suffers because everybody is conditioned to love the life that they are born into or whether we should have the right to be miserable. That's kind of the main philosophical debate on which this dystopia, utopian dystopia hangs. So the idea is it's a world where everybody from birth, um, everybody's like produced in a factory, uh, so nobody has any relations, uh, nobody has any of the sort of close and intense ties and therefore like strong love but also strong difficulty that comes from those intense ties and everyone is conditioned from birth to love and desire the life in which they end up and so everybody leads these very sort of vanilla lives um, in which they are always happy and never struggle. Um, it was a weird book, gonna put it out there. I felt for the first half of this book or so, like it had been written by a sex obsessed, socially awkward 14 year old boy. Um, because in this world, the idea is that you just like have sex with whoever you want all the time and you are an odd person if you are not constantly having sex, which is weird. Um, I didn't find the writing particularly good, I found the characters quite flat, as is often the case in dystopias, you know, the point is more about the world that's created than it is about the characters. Um, there was this whole weird thing about the savages who were people who were just living like normal normal lives um, but they were Native Americans I think was the implication. I don't know, the whole thing just felt a bit dodgy to me. Um, I guess this is a classic because of when it came out. It came out in the 1940s. I guess it was insightful and sort of different when it came out. There's a lot of people who chat about how this is still really relevant today and obviously there are there are aspects of it that are really relevant still today but I felt like this has dated in a not particularly great way and I just didn't love it. There are some dystopias that I've read as an adult and really enjoyed but there are a lot of dystopias I've come to as an adult and I feel like I've missed the boat with them. This is one of those ones. Maybe had I read this when I was a lot younger, when I was less critical, when I was more willing to suspend my disbelief, I don't know, maybe this would have impacted me harder. But I think so many dystopias, the ideas of them have so embedded themselves into our society now that the idea of this didn't shock me at all because I kind of already knew the arguments and had already reflected on them. And then given that really the best thing about this is the idea and the writing and the plot and everything else and the characters are a bit naff. I didn't get much out of this. Yeah, was not a fan. Finished it because it is famous. And then lastly, not a favourite book, but one of my favourite books of all time. I'll show you the book rather than the postcard so it hopefully focuses. The Country Child by Alison Attlee. This is a book that has been my favourite book really since childhood. It is the fictional story of a young girl called Susan Garland growing up on a farm in rural Derbyshire in the very early 1900s um, and it is just exquisite. The writing in this is so stunning that you still have to read it to believe it. It's one of those books that's kind of a children's book but kind of really for anybody. The protagonist in it is a child and yet the insight into the child's world is just so deep and perceptive and beautiful. The nature writing in this is absolutely top-notch and it just takes us through a year in her life 
talking about all the little moments that make up her year. It's an incredibly seasonal read. It's really just so charming and beautiful. But without avoiding talking about the hardships of life on the farm, I haven't read this since I was a child. I used to read it and reread it and reread it loads and loads and loads when I was younger. But I haven't read it now for a very long time and it was a really beautiful and moving experience to come back to this for the first time as an adult because when I read it as a child I very much was Susan. I saw the world through her very serious and imaginative eyes. Coming to it as an adult I am able to kind of laugh at her in the most affectionate and loving way possible but she is actually quite a funny character, she's so serious um, and I guess as a child I was maybe a bit like her, I completely identified with her. She kind of takes everything literally as children do, she goes off into these imaginative flights of fancy and it's just so charming and adorable and heartwarming to see her doing those things as an adult. I got a lot more out of observing the descriptions of the adults coming to it as an adult. I had no interest in them when I was a child. Um, but just looking at like the makeup of the farm, the way that the family, the two parents and the child lived with the farmhand and lived with a really elderly man who used to be a farmer but had gone bankrupt due to just unfortunate events, you know, luck, it's made very clear that luck plays a huge role in a farmer's life and that you can be completely ruined through no fault of your own. And so the family have this gorgeous elderly man living with them, kind of half as a servant, kind of half as an act of hospitality, um, and they also have a young maid living with them, and it's just really interesting to see the ways they interact, you know, the maid can't read or write, um, there are all these amazing references to all the sort of country superstitions that they have. It's a world in which everybody is incredibly, incredibly religious and yet at the same time these kind of quite pagan beliefs run completely alongside these super Christian beliefs with nobody batting an eyelid at the incongruity of this. I rule this was just absolutely as beautiful as I remembered it being. I Oh, I could even say I loved it even more reading it now as an adult than I used to love it as a child. This book has meant an awful lot to me, but I would also say that objectively it completely stands out in its own right as a phenomenal work of writing. I'll link down below an episode on Miranda Mills's YouTube channel. She runs a comfort book club and The Country Child was their read for December. The discussion on it that she has with her mum is just absolutely brilliant. They talk about so many fascinating things and I think if you ever read this book or if you have already read it, I could not recommend highly enough going and checking that episode out. It brought me an awful, awful lot of joy to hear people talking about how much they love this book too, because it truly is a treasure. So that's everything I read this January. Do let me know down in the comments what you read in January, especially anything that you read and particularly enjoyed. I feel so lucky to have had such a wonderful start to my reading year. I mean, The Rainbow in particular was just a phenomenal delight and I really enjoyed so much of what I read and I definitely enjoyed reading so much. So yeah, very grateful for my lovely reading month. I hope you had a lovely reading month in January too and if not, fear not, the year is only just beginning. There are so many wonderful things to come, I am sure. Please do give this video a like if you enjoyed it and subscribe if you haven't done so already. It really helps support this channel. I appreciate you watching ever so much and I look forward to seeing you very soon in my next video. Bye bye.